Hi, everyone. We're going to give it just a few minutes to let a few people join us. Oh, we've got our first couple of attendees already. Hi to Matt. If you're just new and joining us for the first time, just let us know whereabouts you're based in the world. We're always interested. I guess while we're waiting for people to join, it may be interesting to share um, where I guess everyone on the call is joining from as well. Um, Dinesh and Andreas, do you want to sh quickly share where you're coming in from? Dinesh, up to you. Yeah, absolutely. So just just north of London in the UK, about 20 minutes north on the train, which is far enough away, yet close enough when you need to be. Cool. I'm born and raised in the Netherlands, and I actually live a little bit outside Amsterdam. But uh, for most of the people, the entire Netherlands is just outside Amsterdam because I'm 40 minutes away from Amsterdam, and that means I'm only 30 minutes away from Germany. Um, and that tells you about the size of the Netherlands. So uh, enjoying the countryside while still being close to uh, all the bigger cities. Awesome. And I'm coming in from Orlando, Florida. Um, so it's unbelievably hot here at the moment. Um, but normally it's a really exciting place to be. A few more attendees in now. Hello to Alex. Hi, Anna, Damien, Gitesh, uh, Matt Collins. Just, yeah, please drop us a message inside the chat. And let us know where you're from. We'll just give it another minute or so, and then we'll kick things off. If I take a look at the chat, I only see host and panel members. Is that correct? Is the chat open for everyone? We should have attendees in there. Um, looks like, Gitesh, are you, I think you're raising your hand in there. Um, welcome. If you guys wanna add where you're coming in from, we'd love to hear. Okay, so fair. I think uh, yeah, it's a few chat is disabled. Okay, let me try and figure that out because I know we want to have some questions later on. So uh, bear with us. We'll get that figured out for now. I think we're going to get started. Um, so, so fair. If you want to take it away, sure. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. We're really excited about this webinar. Um, we're going to be learning about maximizing developer efficiency with Sivo and Stack State. Um, as we go through, um, we'll do a deep dive um, into getting started with Kubernetes, um, really digging into the impact of quick cluster launch times and developer experience. Um, and then it'll move over to Andreas, who will talk about setting up Kubernetes and deploying now, now that you've had them deployed, um, how to operate them and what challenges you'll face, um, and then just secrets for your engineering teams. Um, so really excited. If you guys have any questions moving forward, please feel free to add them in the chat. I believe Ricky is getting that up and running, um, but we're looking forward to kick things off. Cool. Awesome. So our two amazing speakers here, I have um, Andreas and Dinesh. So we're going to start things off with Dinesh. Um, Dinesh is the CTO at Sivo, the first pure play cloud provider. Um, he has a background ranging from working in data centers to website development, cybersecurity, and hosting. Um, now Dinesh has a huge love for teaching others and sharing his passion for building products that seamlessly scale. In his free time, he loves taking his dog Puzzle um, to agility courses. Um, so if you get a chance, definitely reach out to Dinesh. His dog is very cute. Um, Andreas uh, is the CEO at Stack State. It's a product company with a strong focus on troubleshooting apps running on Kubernetes. He has a huge passion for efficiency and streamlining processes. Um, outside of work, you'll have to talk to Andreas about his craft pizzas um, that he bakes in his wood fire grill in his backyard. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and kick things off. Um, but before we do, wanted to quickly touch base on a really exciting event that we have happening in London. On September 5th and 6th, we're going to be hosting Sivo Navigate. 
Um, we're expecting up to 1,000 people in the heart of London focused on tech innovation. So this is a two-day event with over 50 speakers and 10 hands-on workshops. Um, some of our keynotes include Kelsey Hightower, um, Marty Weiner, and Nick Caldwell. We'd love to see you there. If you have any questions about that um, or would like to discuss it more, please feel free to reach out in the chat. I'll include a link at the end of this webinar, um, but feel free to go ahead and copy that 50 pound code right there. Um, that is a steal for these tickets. They're normally about 400 pounds. Um, so we really wanted to offer a special incentive for um, people on this webinar today. Awesome. So moving forward, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to Dinesh. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm glad of two things. Well, one I'm not so glad about, but I wish Andreas I'd known about the pizza stuff before we organized uh, Navigate and we'd have got you in the corner with your wood fired pizza oven and everything. And um, I'm glad the dog isn't there because he would definitely be taking the pizzas out of the oven and running away listen, with them. Listen, I booked my tickets. So if you're open up for a challenge, I'm absolutely happy to give a pizza baking workshop somewhere at the end of the day and talk nicely about developer efficiency, troubleshooting, CICD while baking pizzas. We uh, we should certainly chat about it. I think that would be amazing. Yeah, we should definitely try and organize that. <laughs> um, so firstly, thank you, Sophia, for the um, the lovely intro. It feels like I don't need to to talk about myself much, but yeah, huge history in, in tech uh, and innovation. Um, and recently with Sivo, uh, really excited about building now a public cloud to kind of add to everything that we've been we've been doing. Um, so I think with what we're doing um, at Sivo is really focusing on Kubernetes. And when we started our public cloud, we were thinking about Kubernetes and all of the problems that you have getting up and running with Kubernetes. So um, I remember the days when you were self-signing certificates and getting them all into infrastructure to get up and running. And once you've done all of that and you somehow have an understanding of Kubernetes at that layer, You've then got to work out how to deploy your applications to the cluster and things like containerization and moving your applications over into that world is now commonplace, but it wasn't when Kubernetes started and felt that there are two ways that the tech industry kind of went, which was deploying applications to Kubernetes or running Kubernetes. And whenever we've looked for engineers or looked at products, the two problems are very, very different. Um, and I think, you know, the stack trace product is that a real mix between the two of them of getting you up and running and then keeping you running while allowing you to, to focus on, sorry, the lights here are, are terrible, <laughs> um, while running as well. Um, so, you know, when Sivo, when we came about, we really wanted to tackle those challenges about running Kubernetes to allow you as developers to stay really, really efficient, really, really focused on what you are good at which is developing applications, fixing bugs, serving your customers and making your, you know, the underlying infrastructure that you're using really, really simple, really, really fast and something you don't have to worry about. So if you compare us to some of the other providers out there that you'll have seen, um, you know, the AWS's, the Google's, Azure's, um, this is what we're really, really focused on about giving you a fast experience of getting clusters up in 90 seconds being really, really transparent on our pricing as well. So $5 a month is where you start from. And we try and get rid of all of those hidden charges that you get at the end of the month and really focused on this developer experience because, um, you know, if you're using some of these uh, other tools that are out there, it could take you 20, 30 minutes to wait to get a cluster up and running. You've got to learn various stages and steps and hoops that you've got to jump through to get your infrastructure up and running. And realistically, as a, a developer myself and you know, doing home projects and everything, that's the last thing that I want is go, great, I've got this amazing idea. I've got all of this code. I want to get it on the internet. And I've got to wait an hour just for getting my account set up and getting learning all of the tools, setting up everything. So what we've done at Sivo is make everything sensible defaults that you go, give me a cluster and we'll make it secure out of the box and create some really great defaults. Hey, before you move on, because this is, a, I do see a pretty interesting movement in the market because um, there's a big movement that people would love to learn new skills, right? And develop new skills. And then Kubernetes, right? As the next kit on the block is really kind of the thing you want to master. 
But if you think about regular engineering teams who should focus on feature development, because that is where the business distinguishes itself from its competition, right? In speed or capabilities or whatever. If you spend an hour on setting up your cluster, but more, eh, if you spend days learning the technology to do it in an hour, you're taking away all that valuable time. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, how, I see this very often at our customers, and I'm wondering how it is for you that that so many people just think it's it's important. I mean, it's important to have it, but it's not important that everyone masters the skill of doing all that manual work. So how do you see that at, at your customers happening? I know it's definitely exactly the same thing of, of our customers really want to be running their applications. They don't want to be worrying about a control plane. They don't want to worry about load balancers. They don't want to worry about firewall rules. They don't want to even worry about upgrades, right? Because at the end of the day, you're right. That isn't delivering business value. It isn't making customers smile. Yeah. Of if you go, you know, oh, I was in a, a, a customer meeting and I said, really, really good news. I got your Kubernetes cluster upgraded from 1.25 to 1.26. No one's going to turn around and say, well done. Oh, amazing. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so if you, so if, so but this is interesting, right? Because the topics is developer efficiency. And actually the light you're putting onto this is say, hey, radically change your focus, right? Don't, yeah, so, so not even bother about optimizing how you do Kubernetes, but just don't do it. Right, take a solution that will do it for you and free up all the time that is needed there. Exactly, exactly. And I think you know, finding a partner, and we really do think like cloud providers should be partners, not necessarily if you go with Sivo, but all of the providers out there are partners, and you should be working with them collaboratively to get the services for your customers and your end users. Because at the end of the day, we're all just little parts of a very big jigsaw puzzle, and an end user is is an end user um at the end of the day um yeah so that developer efficiency around cluster launch time is really really changing how people are looking at kubernetes and um, address the conversations that we're having around what fast clusters mean because if you go back a few years ago and probably still today if it's taking you 20 30 minutes to launch a cluster and you've got this brand new application that you want to run, the standard deployment topology now is to create a namespace and deploy that new application into another new namespace. And that's fine until that application grows or at that application has problems, it runs out of resources, and suddenly you've now got your new shiny toy breaking production and you're getting paged at the end of the night. Um, and what fast cluster launches means and is that you can now potentially just bring up a brand new cluster for that new application. And with the pricing and everything that's there, you don't have to, again, worry about it. And you don't have to worry about the impact and the blast radius of one application having on another application. And we've traditionally done this for production. You know, you'll have a UAT cluster, a production cluster. So you, we do know that this is the right deployment technology, uh, topology, sorry. But because it takes a long time, we've never pushed it down to developers. So if it takes 90 seconds to get up a brand new cluster for your application, why aren't you giving your, each one of the developers their own Kubernetes cluster no. that they can break and they can test things on and they no. can learn on? Yeah. No. Yeah, which is interesting because um, the entire CI/CD movement, right? The automation has brought us a lot on the developer side of the house, but then we were still kind of reliant on on the slightly slower infra and whatever provisioning. And actually, your statement is if you want to accelerate the developer efficiency even further, not only in the build and the deployment process, why not taking that entire provisioning, if you like, into that same speedy thinking and just just combine the two and just make it part of it, spin up a new cluster, then deploy, and then, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, if, when you put things like um, external DNS, so external DNS is a tool that will watch for ingresses in your cluster and automatically register DNS endpoints. Um, so you suddenly get external DNS access into your dev environments if you wanted to. Firewalls and everything are highly required and recommended. But, you know, you've got the centralized area of that, you've got something like cert manager that you can deploy in. And now you've suddenly got a dev environment that has got valid SSL certs, valid external DNS that can be routed out from externally. Yeah. Um, and at the end of the day, just delete it because tomorrow it's 90 seconds and you're up and running again. 
Hey, do you sometimes get the pushback um, that the, the real benefit lies in the first part of the process and not necessarily in the second? But yeah, because I, I just eh, need to cluster every every week or every month or whatever. So why would I care about that second part? And what is then, eh, because I do hear that quite often, and what is then a kind of your counter argument to still accelerate that, that platform provisioning as well? Are the when you get into production, you still have all of these other tools like external DNS and, and um, cert manager that are there, right? And trying to get people to learn about that as developers can be really, really hard. But, you know, we're seeing this shift left movement happening more and more with all topics, right? Shift left security, shift left testing, shift left engineering, right? This whole idea of um, misconstrued but you kind of see devops and people think developers should be doing ops i know it's not i know it's a culture and everything but there is this pattern that's like oh you're a developer therefore you'll also be responsible for all of the ops side of things as well yeah. so pushing these down into developers getting at least visibility of it not necessarily the scale that you need to run at production is really really useful for application development yeah. because you know, you do get into production and suddenly you've got a hundred pods running your microservice. Yeah. That's vastly different to a, like a little run up on my local dev machine. Yeah. Cool. Um, and the other kind of topology that I wanted to touch on is this idea of, um, cattle and pod, uh, cattle and pets, right? So pets is this idea that you have this one thing that you're running and that you look after and that you upgrade and you really, really care about. And this used to be a server that sat in a data center that was a physical bit of kit that you looked after and your applications were deployed to that. With containerization, we have decided that that's really not a good thing to do and we should treat our application containers now as these things that we can throw away. If they break, just delete it because another one will come and replace it. So you're, you're treating your application as almost like a herd and you're not worried about individual members of the herd, just that the entirety of the thing is um, happy and safe. However, we've now moved this idea of a pet to the cluster level because we now have this cluster that you've got to look after, you've got to babysit, you've got to make sure it's monitored, you've got to make sure it's well fed, you've got to you know, keep it upgraded and everything. With fast clusters, we're now starting to see people moving to, oh, I'll just delete the cluster and I'll create a new one. And these things like external DNS means that, cool, everything's fine. It just carries on working. And it's a really, really interesting paradigm now with Kubernetes of trying to treat your clusters as completely replaceable. Um, the last thing that I'm going to demo because I think is really, really cool and really, really exciting is that you can now start doing CICD testing of your infrastructure side of your applications. Um, so in your, we, we're used to CICD for code changes and things like unit tests, fast clusters, and I'll show you in the demo. It's a really interesting way of doing that there. So if we swap over, if I've got my mouse somewhere um, to here, so I have got a go test that I'm going to run out here. Uh, oh, cached. Excellent. I think that will uncache it. You know what you do? You test your demo just before the webinar and it then breaks everything. <laughs> um, so my hands are away from the keyboard. And what we're doing here is we're using Terraform to provision a brand new cluster with Sivo. We're going to deploy an application to it, and then we're going to run some tests against it. So what we've got output here, it's a bit difficult to see. I'm trying to get the zoom level right, but we've got a new cluster creating. What I've got down here is this cluster being created in Sivo. So this is a brand new cluster that's coming up and spinning up. We can see here that we're getting some output that the control planes are starting up in the background. We'll eventually see now that new nodes are joining to the cluster. Um, and what we'll then do using Terraform, here we go, we've got some nodes coming up, is we'll deploy Nginx and we'll deploy traffic to it. And this testing script will then connect to those bits of infrastructure and test that they're actually running, which is 
just incredible that you can do this within two or three minutes. And yeah, let's move over to the code while that's doing it. So it's 60 lines of code here um, to do all of that testing work. So we are using Terraform, which is an infrastructure as code tool to deploy a cluster. Um, if we come over here, we've got the cluster object here. So with um, you know the simplicity that we're going for with Sivo, this is this is all the definition that you need to deploy a Kubernetes cluster. We're just talking about the node count, the size, and a firewall that you're using to connect with. We've then using Trafic to deploy a Helm chart to that cluster, and we're using this again to deploy out Nginx to it. So I do need to be quick here because. What TerraTest Terra does is it destroys it all at the end of it. So this is the output now of a um, of that cluster. So it's a brand new cluster that started up. We've got traffic deployed to it. We've got Nginx being deployed to that now. And within a few seconds, we should see this all get blown away. And if when we go back to the test screen, we'll see that that has done that an HTTP request. There we go. That's all crashed. It's all died. So it's being destroyed now. And if we scroll up through this test output, uh, we can see here we're making these HTTP requests to that new cluster that we've created. So this is just game changing of moving to this idea of treating clusters as cattle and that you can now start rapidly iterating on some of the tools that are out there on clusters. In what what type of situations? So imagine I'm, I'm I'm a development team. In what type of situations would you apply this in particular? Where what moment in the journey? I guess early on, right when you're still defining and, and figuring out how everything needs to be set up. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah. So it's we're seeing this used for that um, less in this sort of structured format. So what we find is customers will go, oh, I've heard about Stack State. I really really want to try it. And they'll internally go to their uh, ops team and say, I've got this really, really cool thing. Can I deploy it into the production cluster? And you know what they're going to say, right? They're going to say, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so what we're finding is people are able to spin up a brand new cluster, install stack state on it, verify it works, and then not only go and give a demo to the ops team of this is amazing. We love it. It's going to rapidly speed us up. We've also done some of the work of doing this is the Helm chart that you need. These are the values and having your developers or the people doing like research to hand that over to an ops team in a package and a bundle yeah. is creating that like it's making that experience between the two teams really, really smooth and really, really slick. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the next place that we're seeing it is this is more for the engineering team than the, the, the ops part of the that DevOpsy piece that I know is not <laughs> not a, two teams, it's a culture, but the people that are looking after it, um, they're able to now test upgrades of the components that are deployed to clusters. So in this example, we've got a traffic deployment here. Um, this isn't pinned to a version, but with Helm, you can say, right, this is traffic version one. And these are the tests that will prove that traffic works. When traffic version two comes out, normally it's a manual step of tests that the ops team have to do to validate that traffic version two doesn't break anything. Whereas with rapid cluster launches, we finding ops are able to spin up a cluster, validate traffic, then go and deploy the entire production estate of applications to it to validate, cool, traffic hasn't broken anything. Let's send it out to production. Um, I appreciate that demo is really, really quick. It's really, really in depth. So this is all based on something that is public. Um, so if you want to go and run this yourself, um, this GitHub repo is there. The two commands that you need, there might be another one to get um, like your config, um, your uh, CI, sorry, your Sivo token into an environment variable. But literally, it is a Terraform init and a go test. And you're now in this situation where you can take that and run with and keep 
iterating and getting some really, really interesting things when it comes to downtime. Um, spoken a lot about multi-clusters. Um, I've made it seem like it's really, really easy and that everything, you should just go and do it tomorrow and suddenly you've got 40, 50 clusters running around and I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say, yes, that's exactly what you need to be doing. So costs is something you need to be aware of. Um, Sivo is very, very cheap, but that may not be the case with the provider that you're currently with. Um, and there will be extra potential hidden costs. So if you're moving data from between clusters, there might be costs around that. Um, recommend using an IAC tool like Terraform um, to start allowing you to rapidly iterate. Um, but one of the biggest challenges I think around this though, is when you suddenly start having, when you go from one cluster to 10 clusters, the ability to see across all of these clusters becomes really, really difficult. And this idea about distributed tracing for microservices, the challenge space just, just increases again, when you're now tracing across multiple clusters, potentially across multiple regions. Um, and I think, you know, that monitoring observability incident response piece, um, is something that, that really there are tools out there that can, that can help. And I think, you know, the stack safe piece is something that really fits in well with this idea. Yeah. And if you, if you take a look and we just chatted prior to the webinar about KubeCon, uh, last year or last April in Amsterdam, um, the amount of interest in technologies like EBPF, right. With Cilium, uh, to in particular do this exact Hey, how how is stuff connected? How do how does it operate? That is uh, that's absolutely what's uh, what's happening and what's rising in uh, in the market. Yes, absolutely. So I think if I stop sharing, hopefully Andreas, hand over to to you for another amazing demo. Let me go to the exact slide. While Andreas is pulling that up, I'm going to share um, a few links in the chat. One that links off to Sivo, um, and one that links off to Sivo Navigate. If you have any questions, again, feel free to put them in the chat. Excellent. Yeah, this is this is really uh, really good, Dinesh. And um, I'm always fascinated. Um, so I'm more more uh, to your point in the observability and monitoring domain. Um, I've been in the CI/CD domain pretty long at another company before running product there. So really, my heart is also in CI/CD and release automation, deployment automation. But I'm fascinated about every of the aspects of software development, how that's more and more being automated there. We've had security and testing. You mentioned them already. Um, what we notice, what is important as well, is um, it's cool to be really up and running quickly. But then the challenge is to be stable, reliable, optimize, uh, effective, to your point, right? Cost. Uh, are you not over-provisioning uh, your clusters, your environments? And the question really is, if that's the case, how do you help out developers to troubleshoot what's going on, but also to optimize um, their, their clusters, their namespaces, their applications? Uh, because we chatted about it earlier. It's not necessarily about Kubernetes. It's really about the business application that runs on top of Kubernetes. And although CI, CD and, and, and platform and cluster provisioning become super easy, running your business application might still be quite a bit of a challenge. Um, I've been leading engineering teams myself and knowing, for example, how all components, how all microservices interact with each other can be already a challenge in a single team. But if your application spreads, say your business application spreads across multiple teams, even multiple clusters to fulfill your business needs, yeah, then navigating that is, is really hard. And what we actually see is that the automation of um, the the, the deployment, the clusters, et cetera, is automated. But now the challenge is, how do you help out engineers to also have a kind of a simple experience in troubleshooting and operating what is going on? And why is that important? Well, ultimately, you want to move away from slow incident response. And at many of our customers, we actually see that solving the issue is not necessarily the problem, but really triaging and discovering where is the issue uh, happening or what is actually the source of the issue, that is really the hardest part. And you only, if you start thinking that through, so how do I help out my engineering teams to operate and troubleshoot my application? Yeah, I believe then you can only really harness the power of Kubernetes because then again, you don't bother about the lower levels, but you can mainly focus on feature development and the applications that run on top. And that is a kind of the mission that Stack State is on. Yes. There are many companies in that first part, 
But then as soon as you are in production, how do you handle what is going on? And what our goal is, I mentioned that before, is really to make the operations of apps running on Kubernetes really easy. And I'll primarily give a demo. Um, but if you think about your current situation, you really might have uh, Grafana to see some of the metrics. You might have Lens, kubectl, k9s. All of them are there to understand actually how is your application behaving on your cluster. And we thought that's need, that need to change because why, to your point as well, Dinesh, why would you educate eh, all your engineering teams in all these four or five tools if there is a different, more intuitive way to do the troubleshooting? That's one. So how do you navigate and how do you see the bigger picture? Then the second one is, what is the status of your health? Um, and can you easily understand that without mastering all your command line um, commands, right? Because that is nice for a platform engineer, for an SRE, for the few real experts. But what if you could abstract that away and if the, the platform really gives you that insight? And last but not least, what is the connection? I mentioned that what if you're working with multiple teams on that single application? Is there a way to provide that bigger picture? And what we see is that primarily then, if you start doing this, the resolution time will go down. And that to me is super important from a developer efficiency, because one, it's helping to reduce the impact for your customers. But second, it's not bothering your most intelligent engineers to troubleshoot um, annoying issues that probably pop up multiple times. So from an efficiency perspective, we believe it's better to spend very limited time on troubleshooting, make that super simple. So you can focus on the development of new features and capabilities. So operating and troubleshooting Kubernetes or apps on Kubernetes is really important. Um, how to cut through the noise? Well, ultimately there are so many incidents or so many, not, not incidents, there are so many data points coming out of Kubernetes. Um, and there are troubleshooting or observability solutions these days in the market that try to reduce the amount of metrics and the amount of data. Why? Well, because there's simply an overload. And the real question is, what are out of all these signals, the signals that really matter? And then you can look into the site reliability engineering handbook, right? That talks about the golden signals. But still, do you have the knowledge to fetch them? Do you have the knowledge to interpret them and to come to the right conclusions? So according to Gartner, navigating this landscape of tools can lead or will lead, if you like, to develop a frustration and dissatisfaction. So where Dinesh talked about, okay, get away of learning all the tools on how to deploy and bring up your clusters. We took the second challenge and say, hey, but how to take away all the tools and the thinking on how to troubleshoot and do that. And ultimately the goal there is to empower developers with all this knowledge and guidance out of the box, because let's face facts. Um, if you start using all these uh, libraries that Dinesh has just shown, that will help you to stand on the shoulders of giants because the scripts are created and you can just, without understanding everything at all, you can just start to use it. Similar pattern we slowly see happening in many enterprises. So site reliability engineers, or if you like the DevOps engineers, how they sometimes call them, or the platform teams, they often have the knowledge. And the question is, is how can you harness the knowledge of these experts, put it into a tool, into a platform, and then all your engineering teams can benefit from that. Why? Because these days they're just giving you phone calls um, and, and creating tickets on, hey, can, you, can I see the logs or is there something going on? It must be Kubernetes, it's not my app. But actually what they say is, I don't know what's going on. Can you provide me with these insights? And that's why bringing logs, metrics, um, events, all in a single UI is what we believe super important for troubleshooting Kubernetes. And without further ado, let me take you into that. So the first thing I talked about is the big picture. And um, I mentioned already uh, that we see in the market a lot of uh, eBPF type of technology and StackState is using eBPF to really help you out, understand how do my services communicate or interact actually with each other. And what I'm showing here is a service map, if you like, or a service dependency map. And if you think about an engineer, it really depends the level he wants to understand and um, actually examine 
the situation. So we see a surface that is in a red state, but we also see that there's impact to my front end surface and my ingress. And all surfaces together compose a uh, sock shell, obviously. So what Stackstate does is it not only provides you a <clears throat> service dependency map, but the first thing it does is it helps you to understand how this front end service has a pod running where we have a container, where is a process running, and that process actually communicates with the follow up service. So if you think about efficiency, understanding the big picture, that's where it starts. And then if you want to start troubleshooting it, well, then it might matter to take a deeper look and build a deeper understanding of what is actually going on. And we're going to do that in a split second. This map, and I'll show that at the end, is a dynamic map. So what I did is I traveled back in time to 1420, so a little earlier today, a couple hours earlier. And that was where this catalog service was at risk, or actually the health was unhealthy. And while doing a kind of the post-mortem, right? So after you've resolved the issue, using the time to travel back is super powerful. I'll show that in a bit. So then the question is, okay, but what is actually going on? And Stackstate not only collects all the topology data, the dependency information, but Stackstate also provides you the ability to understand at a high level what is going on with my service. And later I will show with other components. So rather than um, giving people an empty Grafana dashboard, we believe that the experts, <clears throat> in our case, these are pre-packaged, should and are able to come up with the most important data points. And following the handbook, the golden signals like error rate, throughput, and latency are some of the most important ones, as well as taking a look there at the individual pods, some uh, response metrics for these pods that are running there, and some network throughput. So collecting the data in a single UI is important, but it doesn't stop with metrics. You also sometimes need to know about your config, right? So rather than using your command line to fetch the configuration or even the status of this particular component, we bring that for you in that single UI. So just with a click, you get to that particular point. That's one. And then if you have the data collected, then the next important thing is that you not only have the data, but out of the box, you have the most important um, practices, if you like, or golden standards or whatever you want to call them, applied on top of the data. And in Stackstate, we call that monitor. So out of the box, there are many prepackaged practices that your experts can enhance or that should work out of the box for your situation and you only start extending it. And over here, this particular service has high response time. So HTTP above three seconds. And why is that important? Well, if you think about customer impact, there's a direct customer impact from a latency perspective if the response times are pretty low. So what Stackstate does is thinking about the developer who shouldn't go to Stack Overflow or Google to learn why it is important. We give a brief explanation. We show how this health has happened. So actually this component started to be triggered at 1416 and it was remediated or it was sol solved at 1421. But more important, we give you the ability to understand the big picture because I started with dependencies. And as soon as you start to triage an issue, you need to understand, okay, there's an alert coming in on my service, right? So let's take a look. There's an alert coming in at my service, actually two of them. But is this actually the cause of the issue? Because there are multiple um, related issues. And then quickly, what we see happening here is that the related pod has also a restart issue. And that's the beauty if you have that rich dependency map you can easily navigate and really understand the dependencies, not only from service to service, but through all different components. And then obviously go straight into that pod. So remember, we discovered something at a service that has a high customer impact. And now without you installing anything at all, we're guiding you deeper and deeper into your Kubernetes system. So again, you don't need to understand how container services, pods, uh, PVCs are related to each other. That's what the system does. The screens from one or the dashboards, if you like, from one to the other differ again. Why? Well, troubleshooting a service or a service provides different information and insights compared to a pod. So for a pod, 
Obviously, we also collect the Kubernetes events. Why is that important? Well, they will disappear at any moment from, um, from, the, from the cluster. So you need to have them to really understand what's going on. Or if you like the pods, right? So having an understanding of what's going on, sorry, the logs um, is also really important. So in this case, the logs are not really helpful to understand what is going on. And then last but not least, another data point important for troubleshooting is to identify what was the last diff, what was the deployment that has happened and what changed from one moment to the other, because often a change will cause the issue. So what we see here is that multiple tools, if you think about efficiency, multiple tools are brought together into a single UI. And although a single log analysis solution potentially will go deeper from a log analysis perspective, we bring in the logs for a operation and a troubleshooting perspective. So just enough to ultimately troubleshoot your issues. And then again, different metrics because we're looking at a different component. All right, enough about data. We started at that service and that service was directly pointing towards this particular pod. And this particular pod has an issue with the restart for containers. So again, a little explanation, the health, of this monitor, then the underpinning metric. Indeed, we see the restart count going up. We see again an explanation of, hey, what else is going on on this particular um, issue? And then super important, we provide a remediation guide. And this is in particular, if you think about speeding up your developer efficiency, having a remediation guide can be extremely powerful. And this is where the knowledge of the expert is fetched into a runbook if you like or whatever guidance um, where you can go over step by step and in this case the um, the guide really tells you okay take a look at the pod events whether or not there are uh, particular events that hint towards an issue so what we see happening over here is that there are multiple back of restarting filled container events going on they actually don't tell us exactly what's going on, but it is a hint that indeed the container has issues to get started. Then the logs, I've shown the logs already I had to take a look at errors or fatals. In this case, the logs are not teaching us anything. And then last but not least, it's asking to take a look at the recent change because it very well might happen uh, that, well, it's deployed 20 minutes ago from the moment important that I'm looking at it. So it was deployed at two o'clock. Um, we've assessed the status, the config, and then the change is the one that is helpful for us to understand what is going on. And that's a way, if you think about efficiency, that you're not only learning new tools because we bring it together in the UI, you're not on also learning where to look at from an observability or monitoring perspective. That's what the monitors do for you. And we guide you step-by-step step through all these, well, different data points to ultimately come really quickly to a solution. And again, the topology is there to understand the bigger picture because I've shown a simple topology, but there might be um, replica sets involved, there might be services involved, uh, containers, pods, you name it. So by understanding the bigger picture and be able to really quickly navigate, uh, for example, to this node page, where again, different monitors, different data points, and all of it is really built to let you understand what is actually going on. Um, so that's really from a troubleshooting perspective. And then, not by accident, but I'm landing here at my node, right? It's also interesting to actually see yeah, what is going on, um, for example, from a CPU. What are my biggest consumers from a memory perspective? So troubleshooting is one part of the story. But then if you're a bit more familiar and expert, in what is actually going on, you might want to look deeper into, okay, but what is actually going on in this catalog, in this service, or anything like that. And using that knowledge in a pre-baked uh, fashion is what we think extremely important to accelerate yeah, how you utilize your entire Kubernetes. And on purpose, we bring that to the UI because we believe that the UI simply is a visual way to understand the complexity, yeah? because I'm just opening up one single um, machine, as you've seen, right? And then all of a sudden it expands rather quickly and stack state is even grouping containers and whatnot. 
So knowing how everything is connected is not necessarily needed to, to troubleshoot a particular issue. And avoiding people to go to kubectl and start to navigate the cluster actually without knowing how everything is dependent on each other, yeah, that's simply something we believe uh, teams should really try to avoid. And then out of the box, you get all these uh, overview pages with the core information and uh, all of the screens are really focused on, okay, this one is screaming for attention. Why? Well, the monitors, right? The deviating one in this case is triggering on where to look at. And similar to services, right? This page is screaming for attention. So please take a look at it and, and really solve it. And then if you really want to go deeper, um, yeah, then obviously uh, you can start to pinpoint particular things, right? You can say, okay, I want to take a closer look from uh, whatever this moment to another moment. So you can zoom in a little bit and you can mark particular moments in time, for example, on the service page. And then using related services, you can go really quickly uh, to a pod that doesn't exist at this moment in time uh, because the pod was killed a little before. So let me see if I can still find it. That's the beauty of a live demo. There we go. Um, yeah, so this, and I was now using the time. Yeah, so interesting enough, I saw a problem on my service. I marked a particular time for my service, but hey, this pod actually didn't exist at that moment in time. So why not um, yeah, marking two more um, times and then again, use the related services. So go back to the catalog and then actually discover that there's something similar going on at that moment in time. So you're using an easy way to not only look into metrics, but also to start correlating um, other, other elements of health, such as the health timeline at the bottom, or if you like the insights that the logs um, are provided to you, right? So we see here something going on so that you can zoom in, you can zoom even further in. Well, the logs don't teach me at this moment in time that's something going on. But correlating in a super easy fashion, metrics, logs, events and health is really speeding up your troubleshooting journey. And that's a kind of the essence of what, uh, what Stackstay does. Probably Dinesh, you have a couple, couple questions, couple thoughts. Um, yeah, I think, um, I mean, it's a really, really interesting um, way of looking at the data that's within Kubernetes. And um, from that efficiency point of view of, we always know as, as a developer, I just want to be hand, heads down on code, right? And I want to just be code, 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 code. And that page from the ops team saying it's down in production. What's your first response? It's not my code. Exactly. It can't be my code, right? Exactly. And then that way of working with ops, ops almost have to prove it's your code and you have to prove to ops that it's not. Whereas I think having this single pane of glass that both teams can come together over is so valuable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So how we, how we actually see it happening is um, although it's built for developers, often the platform engineers, uh, so Ops, if you like, is the one who's making the purchase and then recommending it to the developers exactly to solve this problem, right? People are, are, are pointing fingers uh, without coming to the solution. And that's ultimately what is really, uh, what really matters. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is that the kind of journey that you see a lot of you, uh, customers going through then? Is Ops seeing it as a nice tool for on-call and then it going into developers looking over shoulders? Yeah, absolutely. And and that starts in particular, and, and I'm showing here a super simple uh, demo app, uh, but as soon as it gets bigger, and I don't know if my if I remove a couple of the filters, uh, if that would work in this demo scenario. Yeah, there are more. And so as soon as you easily have more multiple teams working on the same application, yeah, how do you know that this ingress, right, is, 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 is interrupted by anything on this side, or is it indeed coming from the other side? So the topology, what we see, provides the big picture. But then really the ability for engineers to go much deeper than just having a yes or no, does it run or not, um, or Grafana dashboard with some metrics, that's really helpful to, um, to accelerate and ultimately exclude. And that's the interesting one. I never expected that, to exclude people from the troubleshooting because you know for certain this is not the case. So rather than eh, pulling in 15 people, you only pull in three people, which means from an efficiency perspective, the other 13 can continue. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've been on those instant response calls with 30 people on it and you've got 
40 people that are there twiddling thumbs because no one on the call is actually responsible for fixing the problem and it's all there just pointing fingers and stuff yeah. so it's really really great to hear yeah. that those instant response calls can get smaller yeah yeah and you know who are who who are invited to these calls your very best engineers from every team right so if you think about efficiency or the 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 the, the waste you're introducing yeah that's that's massive yeah. cool so just to wrap up remediation increasing reliability and ultimately reducing toil and if you would like to try it out yourself um, go to stackstate.com or over here l.stackstate.com slash welcome to stackstate or play.stackstate.com you'll definitely find access uh, there's a full open playground so without the need of you connecting to a cluster you can experience all the capabilities that stackstate has to offer all right over to you sophia Thank you, Andreas. I actually just put those links in the chat as well. So if anybody's interested in checking them out, please feel free. Um, and then same with Sivo, there should be a few links right above that um, to try out Sivo. You do get a free $250 credit when you do sign up. Um, and then I'll add the meetup code one more time. Um, so if you would like a 50 pound code for Sivo Navigate, um, you'll have that as well. But just really quick, I know I think we have time for a few questions. Um, most of the questions that you asked um, were actually, or most of the questions that were asked, asked were actually already covered. Um, but I have one for the both of you um, on how does your platform cater to the existing tools a large enterprise uses for developer collaboration? You first. I mean, we we definitely see the infrastructure side of things coming on when you're looking now at kind of cost saving unfortunately is the t the reason we're getting a lot of inquiries at the moment um it, it's sadly less on efficiency uh, because that's not driving people to make decisions around infrastructure changes but really that cost and it's the ethical side of the transparency around our costings that are really driving people to come and talk to, to Sivo um, about it at the moment yeah, so from our perspective, uh, to answer that slightly different, so where we where we integrate with is uh, yeah any flavor of Kubernetes. Um, we're only uh, testing out at the moment uh, RKE2, so the Ranger version. Uh, we never came around with our customers, but looking at uh, how we support all the others, I believe that one will be supported as well. Um, so all the platform kind of natively yeah interacts with with these platforms. So independent, if you're using OpenShift or on GCP, GKE, or, or AKS, or whatever, that, that doesn't matter much. Um, there's a single agent that will that will fetch the data and then uh, run it uh, with Stackstate. That's one. The second um, part is obviously um, there is, if you like, eh, we have a couple customers uh, that run Grafana on top of Stackstate, not necessarily for the troubleshooting, but really uh, we also store their business metrics because there's um, Victoria metrics, PromQL data store, under the hood, and then you can run a business Grafana dashboard if you like on top of Stackstate. So that's another integration. And if you think about integrating, we're really standardizing on these solutions like yeah, the, the, the PromQL for users to interact with, but also the Prometheus scraper to get the data into Stackstate because we rapidly open telemetry, eBPF, we rapidly see that market um, kind of standardizing and therefore maturing around a few. Uh, and that's where Stackstate natively integrate with. Perfect, thank you. Um, so we have time for one more before wrapping up. Um, so I'll throw this question to both of you as well. What are some effective strategies or tools that developers can utilize to improve their efficiency and productivity in software? I'll, I'll go first. And um, weirdly, the first one and the recommendation I would have is turn off Teams and turn off Slack <laughs> is just the number one thing that you can do. Put it in your calendar, put your status on Slack saying, I'm going to be heads down for two hours and everything else can wait because when I'm in code and I see the little Slack message come up, I'm one of these people that have to look at it and I have to answer it and just turn it off and the world will be fine when you come back in two hours. I really like that answer. And um, just to, to to add to that, if you take a look at the DORA report, the DevOps uh, Institute, uh, whatever research, uh, probably Genevieve, you can paste the link. Um, that is giving also all, a lot of the other insights, right, on, on how to improve efficiency. And ultimately, it's not only about 
platform provisioning or observability or monitoring itself. It's really about the entire, if you like, software development lifecycle, build, test, security, um, really thinking that through from an automation perspective. And I definitely would, although I'm not in that field now, I would definitely also look at that first part of the process because that's where you iterate really fast and primarily in the beginning where you can get the biggest gains. But as soon as you're really for, for real into production, you really need to think about efficiency of that second part. And then troubleshooting solutions, which I want to put aside to monitoring solutions, eh? because you can also go for a Grafana or a Datadog, which is perfectly fine, but you still have a lot of dashboards. You still leave it up to the human to interpret the signals. So thinking about how can I increase efficiency in that second half, I do think is really worth having a team chat about um, and, and thinking about that. Uh, yeah, I think it, it, it's a more serious answer rather than turning off Slack yeah. is is that um, <laughs> that ability, your applications and your code as a developer, and it's really hard idea to get around is, is it's useless unless it's in production. And if it's in production, it's going to break. And having something like Stack State to allow you to fix it when it breaks really, really quickly is worth way more time than you being heads down on a feature that no one is going to see because production's gone and offline and your users just aren't coming back. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much for this webinar. We hope um, that all of our attendees that joined today were able to learn something. Um, if you have any questions for either team, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, we're happy to answer any questions offline. But thank you again for both our um, attendees and Andreas and Dinesh. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, Sophia. No problem.